Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jean McDonald, and I chair the council here at Peninsula United Church, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this, our second virtual worship service on the Sunday of Lent 5. First, Bruce and Janice and I and Denise, except for us, we are all alone in the congregation, except that facing us as we stand at the table is a wonderful picture that was taken on Pentecost in 2018 of the, all the congregation dressed in red. As we don't have a proper bulletin this morning, I'd like to just draw your attention to some of the items that turn up in our weekly highlights document, which most of you get online. First of all, there's a reminder that we are celebrating communion in our worship this morning. So if you don't have a piece of bread and a cup handy, you might want to go get that now so that you are ready when the time comes. I hope that you read Janice's document or piece that was in this highlight bulletin this week. Janice and Bruce would love to receive photos or emails or phone calls from you that deal with issues like physical distance and social solidarity and how you are keeping yourselves and keeping your connections with others about what you are doing to maintain and deepen social, emotional, and spiritual connections. And please note that the message and highlights about our financial gifts. Even though we aren't meeting physically, the work of the church is actually busier than usual and your donations are more important than ever. We anticipate revenues to decrease somewhat as some of our faithful renters may not be able to pay their rent and as we are meeting regularly on Sundays, some of our faithful envelope givings may be missed. We're very grateful for those who are already on PAR and would encourage others to sign on to PAR to give automatically as well. Or you could send in post-dated checks or you could use the donate button on the website. All your donations are beautiful and valued and very needed. I'd like to draw your attention to these flowers that are from the garden of Fred and Evelyn Dobson. They're daffodils and camellias and uh, hyacinths, I think. Finally, after worship today, we're going to try a virtual online coffee hour. You can join by computer or by phone. Just look in the highlights document again and you'll find the instructions about how to uh, sign on for coffee. Bruce? It is good to be with you, and it is good for us to be together in this way, a different way. I invite you now, wherever you are, to take some deep breaths. Breathe in the deep love of God. Breathe out your worries, your anxieties. Breathe in the faithful love of God. Breathe out all that would distract you and separate you from knowing God's presence. We light this candle as a visible sign of Christ, our light, who is always with us. Let us pray. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in singing. Our opening hymn is, Let Us Build a House.
Hello everyone, it's so good to be with you this, whatever time you're gathering to watch the worship. It's good to be with you. And I'm so grateful to see your faces in that Pentecost, uh, Pentecost picture in front of me. So friends, wherever you are, whatever time it is that you've joined for worship, let's join now in a time of prayer. O oh, holy and loving God, we give thanks for this opportunity to worship together this, this day. Even though we can't be sitting and standing side by side or reaching out with hugs and handshakes, we can still experience your love which knows no barriers. We're grateful that you are building a house where love can dwell. It is a house without walls, a home without barriers. It is indeed this whole world that you love, that is home to all of us. And so trusting in your love, which brings us home. We bring our prayers. We bring our prayers of worry and concern. Prayers for those who are sick with the coronavirus, 
for those who are anxious, those waiting to be tested, those who are concerned that there won't be a place for them or people to care for them if they're sick. We pray for families who are grieving the death of loved ones. Those who have died of COVID-19 and, and others who are dying of other causes. We remember the family of Dave Turnbull who died this week. We pray for Kathy and the rest of his family. We pray for those who are suffering with other illnesses and those who have had surgeries postponed in order to free up space in the hospitals. We pray for those who are in care homes and seniors residences and are no longer able to have family and friends visit them. We pray for those in care homes in our own community where COVID-19 has found its way in. We pray for your peace, your comfort to be known. We pray for strength and patience for all who are on the front lines in those care homes. So many people are affected by this virus in multiple ways. So we pray for those who have found themselves without work. and those who are scrambling for childcare because schools have been closed. We pray for the medical professionals and the first responders, many who are stretched thin Give them strength. We're so grateful for their care and their compassion. We pray for the leaders of our country and our community who are working on our behalf during this crisis. We pray for our church leaders, for our moderator, Richard, for leaders within our region, for Trina Duncan, for Kathy Davies, for all the congregations of many denominations across the country who are seeking to share your love in these difficult, challenging times. We bring all of our prayers to you, those that are spoken and those that are unspoken, those that haven't yet been able to find words, those deep heart prayers of both concern and deep gratitude. We offer all of these prayers in the name of Jesus. Who taught us to pray together.
Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 17 to 29. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus to stay. Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had told them and prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I think a basic truth that many of us may have taken for granted has become painfully clear the past few weeks. Food is necessary for survival. It almost seems ridiculous to say that. But this current pandemic that we're in has caused panic buying and hoarding. And it's so sad to go into the stores and see these row upon row of empty shelves. We need food to survive. But we don't just need food for our bodies. Eating is a primary way that we connect with other people and a way that we create community. And many of us are grieving the loss of these opportunities because eating together provides fuel for our relationships. Many of us are sad that we were required to halt the community dinners that are provided once a month by Peninsula United Church. If you've ever attended one of those, you'll know that many folks come to those dinners who uh, live on their own, and they're so grateful to come and gather around the tables with old friends and meet new friends. The conversation and caring over the meal is just as important as the nutritious and delicious food that is served. Eating together is central to being the church. And unfortunately, in the past few weeks, we've had to cancel or push, postpone a number of these meals that we were planning. The Irish dinner that was planned for a couple of weeks ago was, has been postponed. And then the Thursday Lenten lunches, which has been a tradition here on the Semiamu Peninsula for years, Friends gathering from the Lutheran and Anglican, Catholic and United and Presbyterian congregations. Well, we haven't been able to continue those. There was a newcomer's lunch that was scheduled after worship that didn't happen last Sunday. And then our monthly soup Sunday was supposed to be this week. So we grieve those opportunities to connect with one another. We all know that churches love to eat together. In fact, I would say that churches need to eat together. And that's why we're having a virtual communion as part of this worship experience today. Communion, or the Eucharist, as some of you may know it, is a sacred ritual that grew out of the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples 
the story that you heard Jean read a moment ago, commonly called the Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples gathered together to share the Passover meal, a ritual that's been celebrated by Jewish people for thousands of years. Many of you know that the Passover is an annual celebration of the deliverance of Israel from their time of slavery in Egypt. You can read this story in the book of Exodus. And in that story, we hear how the Jews were instructed to take a lamb and slaughter it and take some of the blood and adorn their doorways to keep the final plague, the death of the firstborn from their homes. And then each household roasted the lamb and they ate it along with unleavened bread. They couldn't make bread with yeast because they were in a hurry to leave Egypt before Pharaoh changed his mind again. And so they began their 40 year trek through the wilderness back to the land of Israel. That Passover story is one of the formative stories of the Jewish people, and it's told each year when they celebrate Passover. Now, when Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover, he modified the ritual in a way that must have seen absolutely shocking. And maybe we don't get that because we are so used to our ritual. Some of us have been studying a book by Richard Rohr called The Universal Christ. Unfortunately, another one of those groups that's had to be uh, cancelled or interrupted because of the need for physical distancing. But I want to share with you some of the things that Rohr says about the Passover meal and about communion. He describes the Passover meal that Jesus instituted with his disciples as a ritual that's meant to be more like a stun gun than a pretty ceremony. What Jesus did was a shocking innovation when he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body. Jesus, the one we know as the incarnate one of God, lets his body be broken for us. Much of ancient religion portrayed God as the one who would eat or sacrifice animals and in some traditions, humans, animals or, or people that had been offered on altars. But here, Jesus turns religion and history on their heads, inviting us to imagine that God would give God's self to us, to feed us. So every time we gather for communion, we are uh, invited to receive this absolutely stunning, amazing gift of God's very self. The scandal of this meal that Jesus instituted in a new way continues when Jesus takes the cup of wine and he calls it his blood and he asks his friends to drink it. You probably know that in the Jewish tradition, contact with blood created a state of ritual impurity that required uh, a process of ritual cleansing. But all of that is inconsequential in this Last Supper with Jesus. He says, drink this cup. It's poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And when he says for many, it is really in the Semitic tradition a way of saying for everyone. It's poured out for everyone. So Jesus takes that whole tradition of impure blood, turns it upside down, and makes his blood holy, and even a point of contact with the divine. 
This is an amazing thing that we do here when we celebrate communion. This ritual, this morsel of bread and sip of wine or juice is not a passive ceremony. It's meant to be a life-changing ritual and it isn't reserved for those who are somehow deemed more pure or worthy. Everyone's welcome to this table to receive the fullness of God's love shown to us in Jesus. Did you notice in our text that Judas wasn't excused from the table when Jesus announced that one of them would betray him? Judas ate and drank along with the rest of them. He probably needed it more than the rest of them. And then just after the text that Jean read in verse 31, when Jesus and the disciples were on their way to the Mount of Olives, Jesus said, you will all become deserters because of me this night. You will all become deserters. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus knows that his time is near. He's aware of the plans against him. And he knows that the only way to transform the betrayal, the desertion, and even the cruel death on the cross is to pour out his love. And so he offers his wholehearted love his holy self to each one of us in the bread and the cup. This is no mere pretty ceremony. This is the meal that recognizes the suffering of Jesus and the suffering of millions in the world. It's a meal that takes us from our head to our heart. Richard Rohr says, in this meal, we move beyond mere words or rational thought and we go to that place where we don't talk about the mystery anymore, we begin to chew on it. Isn't that shocking? Jesus doesn't say, think about this, or stare at this, or even worship this. He says, eat this. And we must keep eating and drinking the mystery until one day it finally dawns on us in an undefended moment. My God, I really am what I eat. I also am the body of Christ. That's the incredible revelation that comes to us in communion. We are the body of Christ, each one of us. And we are living the kingdom of God right here, right now, as we love, as we share, and as we care for the world, for everyone. What that looks like is going to be different for each one of you, how you love and care and share. I want to tell you a story, though, about my, uh, a friend of mine told me this week. Nancy and Rick are friends in Seashelt. And Nancy, if you're watching, uh, forgive me, I forgot to ask you if I could use this story, but I know you're generous, so here it goes. Nancy and Rick had been down in Mexico for the last two and a half months, and thankfully they made it home to Seashelt last week and uh, are in this time of, of self-isolation. One, uh, maybe uh, two or three days after being home, there was a knock on the door and Nancy went and opened the door and the neighbor was standing the appropriate six to eight feet away. And he said, uh, we don't get to see each other very much because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working in Vancouver, but now I'm working at home and so I'm here more. And I have more time and I thought I needed to take up a hobby. So I've decided to bake bread. And there on the doorstep, he'd left a beautiful loaf of freshly baked bread for his neighbor. A sign of love, a sign of caring, 
a sign of the body of Christ. Whether we use those words or not, or not it is the body of Christ, broken, shared for each one of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Before we uh, celebrate communion together, it's uh, time for us to practice the another important spiritual practice, and that is the practice of giving. Giving is how we respond to God's generous love. So thank you for all of you who have made your offerings to Peninsula United Church through the pre-authorized remittance or PAR, through your post-dated checks, or whatever means, your generous gifts and your loving actions. Help us all to grow in God's love and to share God's love in the world. Let's join in singing together as we give thanks to God and give thanks for the privilege of being able to share our gifts in God's world. We'll sing number 218 in Voices United. We praise you, O God. Before we begin and receive the Sacrament of Communion, I want to invite you, if you haven't already, to find a piece of bread or something like it. Just whatever you have with you at home. And some juice or wine or even water. Whatever you have is fine. So if you need to, pause the video and grab it. And then we'll be ready to begin so that we can receive and share in this mysterious and wondrous gift given to us by Christ. Let us join together then as we pray our thanksgiving. God is with us. We are not alone. Lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is good, good to, to give, give God, God thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise.
O holy wisdom of God, eternally offensive to our wisdom and compassionate toward our weakness. We praise you and give you thanks for you create life out of dust and sustain us even in the desert. We thank you that in the face of every temptation and trial, every principality and power, and in the midst of every crisis, you are present to direct and guide, to heal, renew, and revive. We praise you for sending us Jesus, your suffering servant. In Jesus, you emptied yourself of power and entered our struggle, taking on our unprotected flesh, you opened your arms wide upon the cross, becoming scandal for our sake, that you might sanctify even the grave to be a bed of hope to your people. Therefore, we join our long procession of pilgrims, praising you along the way. And now we join that long procession of pilgrims who praise you along the way in the words of you are holy, you are whole. Loving God, Holy One, we offer you praise and thanksgiving over this bread and this cup because in Jesus Christ, your only Son, you have joined yourself forever to us, uniting heaven and earth. Loving God, we rejoice in the gift of your grace remembering Christ's life and death, proclaiming his resurrection, waiting in hope for his coming again. Grant that in praise and thanksgiving, we may so offer ourselves to you that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. We remember that on the night that he was arrested, the night before he died, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and said, take, eat. Whenever you do this, remember me. After supper, he took the cup after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is the sign of the new covenant. Remember me. 
remembering your boundless love for us in Jesus Christ. O oh God, we offer you our praise as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God of grace, send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, the gifts that each one of us has before us, that all who share in this bread and cup may be wherever we are, the body of Christ, light and life, healing and love in the world. In this hope and as your people, we give you all praise now and forever. Amen. So I invite you to have before you your own bread and cup. And know that these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, as you listen to the music, I invite you to take your time and receive the elements that you have prepared. As you receive the bread, say, the bread of life. As you receive the cup, say the cup of hope, the bread of life and the cup of hope. cup of hope. Sure. 
O oh God, we give you thanks for the wondrous mystery of this gift in which you give yourself to us. For this extraordinary, scandalous gift. O oh God, may this act, this time, so fill us with your spirit that we might be filled with the compassion of Christ who gave himself body and soul so that all might know life and live abundantly. Help us, O oh God, through these gifts to be agents of your reconciling love, messengers of your hope for a world in fear and worry. May we in some ways, large and small, be agents of your healing love. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's join our voices again and sing together. Let us talents and tongues employ. for this blessing come from William Sloan Coffin. The second part, you'll recognize the first part. It comes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. May God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. And now may the peace, this, may the peace of Christ be with you. Is may the peace of Christ? I guess we'll be looking at that. Yeah. May the peace of Christ be with you. Excuse me. May the peace of Christ be with you. Be 
the peace of Christ be with you.